Welcome to the first in a series of video capsules that will walk you along some of the important and interesting concepts in speech acoustics. So the first question you might ask is, you know, since we've learned about phonetic features and articulation, and we've also learned about the physics of sound waves, uh, why do we need a whole unit of class just to, devoted on this topic? Um, and I'll give you a few interesting examples of this. I'll start out with just the fact that, you know, speech perception is a pretty subjective process. And because of the native language that you speak, because of the dialect you speak, um, because people just plainly disagree on the articulation of sounds, um, it's a really good idea to have an objective measurement of acoustic properties so that we don't base important decisions on matters on which we might disagree. So some examples of this um, are pretty familiar if you're if you have friends or family members who speak a different dialect than you. So for example, in some parts of the country, Don and Dawn are pronounced exactly the same way. Uh, where I grew up near Philadelphia, these are two very distinct sounding names. And so I would always be able to tell the difference between masculine uh, Don and feminine Dawn. But in some parts of the country, they're both pronounced Don. Similarly, in some parts of the country, uh, pin and pen are pronounced the same way. There are websites devoted just to mimicking different accents, and some of them are, you know, maybe more reliable than others. I found this little cartoon about the Chicago accent, and the interesting thing here is that this word bat, because it has the a vowel, and a is affected by the Chicago dialect, um, what we see here is like a weird misspelling of how you might try to pronounce that word. Um, it doesn't really come out as beat, um, more like bat. And so, but there's not really an, a way of describing that very easily using writing. So what we want to do is actually measure objectively what is going on with certain dialects. Alternatively, we could just do it the funny way and just try to spell it out uh, and, you know, <laughs> think about the pronunciation of hockey versus hockey or hot dog versus hot dog. But, you know, even if you are really good at mimicking accents, it might still interest you to figure out what exactly are the acoustic differences between those two pronunciations. Another really common thing to disagree on is the sound of awe. And so there are whole sections of the internet devoted to training people on how to uh, perceive and produce the awe sound as opposed to the ah sound, uh, as we mentioned before with Don and Don. So this, you know, really just substantiates the idea that an objective way of looking at speech might be a really good road to go down uh, as opposed to just relying on your ears or someone else's opinion. Another example of the utility of speech acoustics is understanding the development of speech in children. So for example, this little girl is learning her language, and one of the difficult contrasts for a, a young language learner is between wa and ra. So if we look at a waveform and spectrogram of these sounds, what you can see is a difference in this resonance in the voice versus where it should go for ra. So what we could do is eventually um, track the incremental change as she develops these sounds. Instead of just relying on our ears, we can measure uh, and see exactly how much progress she is in moving this frequency down to that frequency. Another sound difficulty involving ra um, is by people who don't speak English as their native language. So for example, someone who speaks Japanese um, is likely to have difficulty um, perceiving and producing the la and ra sounds, again, because there are certain frequency differences um, that might not be expressed the same way in their language. And so what we can do if someone is trying to acquire the sound is measure out exactly what their production is and see how far they might be from the intended target sound. For a while, I worked understanding the difficulties in producing Vietnamese vowels by people who spoke uh, English as their native language. These are adult, um, adults who, who lived in the United States who are traveling to Vietnam to do diplomatic work. And there's this vowel here that's highlighted that's not U, but U, uh, which is not a vowel that we use in English. And so when they were trying to produce it, sometimes it came out more like a vowel down here, like U. Uh, sometimes it came out like I. Eh because there just wasn't an English vowel that mapped to that sound. And so when they listen to their uh, native language instructors produce a sound more in the center between these two sounds, like U, uh, they had a lot of difficulties. So what we had to do is track the acoustic differences between what they produced and what the target sound really was. Part of that project was not just relying on our ears, but measuring the frequencies of the voice as uh, the resonant frequencies of the voice as they were producing these sounds. So by doing that, 
even if I don't speak Vietnamese natively, I can be a good um, I can be a good judge of the accuracy of the production just by doing the measurements. There's a history of uh, paying attention to speech acoustics and telecommunications. So these electrical engineers or um, audio engineers for music, by having a good understanding and appreciation of speech acoustics can design better systems. So for example, um, back in the 40s, a lot of work was done to understand what frequencies in speech were necessary or sufficient to transmit it over phone lines. So let's take a look at the final syllable here in this. What I'm flashing here are differences of frequency bands. So imagine that we can take some of those frequency bands and just forget about them, just leave them out of the signal. But other bands are absolutely essential or else we wouldn't understand the speech. So on our class website, you can listen to these sound examples, which might come out a little soft right here. Let's try to play this. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Uh, a sentence that we've used before in class. And then this other sentence where we've dropped out the, the lowest and some of the highest frequency bands, leaving only those in the middle. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. So what we just played is a band pass filtered version of the speech, which only gives us frequencies between 300 and 3400 hertz, which turns out to be the range of frequencies that are actually transmitted by most telephones. The details of speech acoustics can be used so that we can learn more about the auditory system. So our ears pay attention to timing contrast and frequency contrast. The difference between deer and tear is only a difference, uh, a very slight difference in timing. What we can see here is a very short initial segment of deer and a slightly longer initial segment of tear. And so by playing sounds that gradually change between these and seeing how we hear them, deer, 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 deer. we can learn how the auditory system handles uh, very slight changes in timing. Similarly, for frequency changes, what we have is a a spectrogram a cartoon here of the differences between sh and s sounds. And we can listen to these as well. So as that gradually changes up from sh, 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 what we can do is measure the exact acoustic change and see whether our auditory system can encode that change. So these are just examples of something that was uh, an inspiration for me as I was learning in this field. And so that DT example turns out to be um, something that I found to be really remarkable because the onset of D is a sound that's about 10 milliseconds long. That's extremely short. That's just about one hundredth of a second. And over there for T, we have 60 milliseconds. So the difference between these, you know, 50 milliseconds is one one twentieth of one second. And the idea that we can we can hear that so reliably that we never really make a mistake between D and T sounds uh, just totally blew my mind. I couldn't believe that our auditory system could reliably keep track of, of differences this small. And as it turns out, we can keep track of differences even smaller than that. So if you heard just a series of, of sound pulses that were just 50 milliseconds, uh, separated by 50 milliseconds, it would sound like this. Play that again. So they're really rapid. So imagine um, having to keep track if one, just one in that sequence was just out of place. Uh, as it turns out, we could do that. So if you played these sounds and the second one has, as you can see, this one pulse missing, it sounds like this. All right, so there's a little difference between these sounds, which, you know, it doesn't sound like speech, but if you listen to this sound under headphones, um, you would be able to tell the difference between those sounds. So as it turns out, those tiny details in the waveform are still perceptible, whether you're talking about speech or talking about music. So earlier in my career, when I was um, recording and, and playing and editing music, um, if I tried to cut and paste different parts of the song to flow together, um, I would have to avoid what you see right here in the center of the screen. So we have a nice clean sine wave leading up to the center, and then there's a bit of a break in that sine wave, and it doesn't look like it's a, a, a dramatic variation from the ongoing signal, but as it turns out, we can hear that, that, that blip every time. So first I'll play what the sine wave should sound like here, and once more. And when we play this version that has this little discontinuity in the middle, it sounds like this. Once more. 
So you'll notice that there's a little t right in the middle, and listen for that right in the middle of the sound. So that little detail um, can be picked up by our ears and our auditory system, and, and we can use that to, to learn about what are the important features in the acoustic signal that we actually pay attention to. So we'll wrap this video up. Um, this was just our introduction uh, to speech acoustics and why we want to why we want to do it and maybe some inspirational things. Um, and then what we're going to look at next is the relevant terminology as we're talking about different levels of understanding specifically for timing details. We'll get into understanding vowel acoustics using a source and filter model and then uh, have an entire lecture uh, entire little like lecture capsule video just on vowel formants. Uh, which we've talked about before as resonant frequencies, but now they deserve their own special attention here. The f the um, fifth video here will be the longest because continents have a lot of features um, that we'll, we'll touch on as best we can to make sure we're all on the same page to understand that. And there's a particular consonant feature called voice onset time, um, which is one of the most well-known and well-understood consonant features, so that if you're going to understand any one in a lot of detail, that's probably the one. In the seventh video, what we're going to do is reflect on what we can see or what we can't see uh, using the waveform, spectrum, or spectrogram versions of looking at speech to make sure we know where to look uh, in these in these graphs to obtain the information that we want to get. And finally, uh, number eight, what I'd wanted to do is just something a little bit more, I don't know, unconventional and fun to think about this Ant-Man character who, who grows to a huge size or shrinks down to a super tiny size and to figure out what his voice should sound like as he changes to those size, which we can figure out just by using some of the principles of acoustics, particularly the source and filter model, and figure out what his voice should sound like in that movie. So this video, as well as uh, the ones upcoming, um, takes advantage of a lot of material that's already online. The I want to give credit where it's due, as well as to direct your attention to this um, highlighted link down here, which walks you along a lot of different views of different speech sounds, as well as giving you some insight and a narrative as to what the authors are looking at. Um, so we'll we'll get to that in, in a lot more detail as we look at vowels and, and consonants individually. Um, but I just want to plant that URL here in case you want to look ahead and take a look at that. So we'll wrap the video up, and I'll see you next time as we talk about the relevant terminology for timing uh, in speech acoustics.